make a start of course. Can I um, welcome you all to today's Transport Committee? Um, obviously there's a few housekeeping things that I have to uh, remind uh, what to do. First and foremost is check your mobile phones. I've just done mine to make sure it's not going to disturb us at any point during the proceedings. Um, obviously we've got a microphone system uh, for everyone's um, facility in terms of being able to hear the full details of the debate and discussion. Please can I remind everyone to use the microphones and make sure that their mouth is in a suitable proximity to ensure that kind of everything's picked up on the microphone system. In terms of uh, fire alarms, there's nothing scheduled, so if anything does happen, then we've got that very polite lady um, talking to us about the need to evacuate the building if we follow her instructions accordingly. And then filming and photography, obviously we very much encourage this, um, however we always ask that because certain uh, filming uh, devices may interfere with the induction loop or the microphone system, if they can just speak to uh, our democratic services team accordingly to make sure that nothing is going to interrupt um, the transmission, if you will. Okay, uh, moving into the agenda proper then. If uh, item one is apologies for absence, have we received any apologies, Charles? No, Chair, no apologies. Okay, I think. Uh, Harry, yeah. There's uh, apologies for Chair Philbin. Okay, and I assume Natalie Nicholas is, is late, so she might have got caught up at work as well. I know she, had, uh, she was busy with sort of uh, the hospital that she, she works in today. Um, other than that, are we going no further apologies? Okay. Uh, second item is obviously declaration of interest. And that's just for me to remind anyone that if there is anything now or at any time during uh, the proceedings of today's meeting, please don't hesitate to, to highlight that accordingly so we can get it recorded um, efficiently. Then moving on to item three, which is the minutes of the last meeting. Um, I'm just going to take the liberty to point out where I'd spotted a very slight error in one of the things that I'd said, which is on page three, the third paragraph down, because we were talking about um, Crossrail for the North, Northern Powerhouse Rail, and all those things. Um, within the um, first sentence, um, it reads, in terms of prioritising groups, the Chair, Councillor Robinson, felt it was in the best interest of the UK to ensure that Liverpool City Region had the next uh, national rail infrastructure and asset priority rather than strategy, um, as Liverpool to Manchester has the strongest city-to-city -city passenger journeys. Um, so if we can just um, amend that accordingly, are there any other bits anyone spotted in the, the minutes? Other than that, can I move them as a correct record of what happened back in March? Is that agreed? Super. Okay, into um, some of the kind of more detailed stuff then. Um, item four is the quarterly bus update, and uh, Matt, I think you're presenting this one for us. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, so this is. Um, so this is the uh, regular update to uh, the committee around bus issues. So focusing really on quarter four, um, so January to uh, to March of this year. So as, as we do normally, we've built this um, report around our key areas of work. So uh, for this quarter, it's our approach to transforming cities funding and improving bus punctuality. Uh, the work of the Liverpool City Region Bus Alliance uh, and the business case uh, supporting bus devolution. So I'll focus on those three things and, and, and touch on a, a couple of other areas of related work as well. Uh, the reports for information, uh, but I'll be happy to take obviously any questions uh, related to what's in the report uh, at the end. So I'll begin with our uh, update on our corridor approach to improving bus journeys, which uh, we've agreed um, with, uh, within the structure of the, the bus alliance and is now, uh, is now progressing. We're turning the project green bus routes, so if you hear me talking about green bus routes, uh, or if hear others talking about green bus routes, that is what this is referring to. Uh, as I touched on last time, what we want to see is a step change in improvements to bus services. And for us, it makes sense to start that 
step change by focusing on the key uh, commuter corridors, key bus corridors, where we can have the greatest impact on the largest numbers of passengers, and also where we see uh, the majority of the challenges in relation to smooth operation of a, of a bus service. Um, in the last few uh, weeks and months, we've developed uh, a brief um, which we uh, intend to put out to uh, consultants. We've developed that with, uh, with our partners across the city region, also with the input of the bus operators. We've agreed it with the key route uh, network group of, uh, of all the authorities. Uh, and this brief, when, it, um, when, when that comes back and we, we start work on it, will support us in developing the different options that might be available across some of the key bus routes that, that we've identified and also help identify the options but also help to assess some of those options as well as listed in the report what those initial sets of routes are. I'll say now and I'll, I'll, uh, I said it last time that we welcome suggestions around those corridors about what members might wish to see, about what customers might wish to see but also what other corridors in future we might want to, uh, we might want to, uh, to look at as well. Uh, turning now to a more general update on the Bus Alliance, we've now agreed the, uh, the business and investment plan for, uh, for what's now this year, 2019-2020. We've agreed that and we've signed that off um, through the uh, Alliance Governance. The detail of that is uh, appended to the report. Again, I don't intend to go through that uh, in any detail, but happy to take uh, any questions that members may have. What we're going to do this year is focus really around three priority areas. Firstly, the punctuality, reliability and the resilience of the bus network, improving the customer journey and also growing the customer base as well. Um, a lot of that kind of follows on from themes that we've, we've had previously, but if you like consolidates and focuses our minds a little bit more around three uh, different areas. In recent weeks, we've seen some really encouraging uh, results again for, uh, for the Alliance, particularly in terms of patronage uh, and also in terms of customer satisfaction. So on patronage, we've seen a 9% increase, a 9% year-on-year -year increase in fair pay patronage. That's comparing the first three quarters of, uh, of last year with the previous period uh, the year before. So, uh, and within that, we've seen strong growth in, uh, and this is the first time in adult patronage. Uh, that's really encouraging and, um, and really kind of supports the aims of the, the Alliance in terms of trying to make the bus network as, uh, as sustainable as possible. And a lot of our work has actually been focused up around that. So it's good to see uh, those results coming through. And then in terms of customer satisfaction, uh, we've recently had the results of the National Bus and Passenger uh, survey. Although we've seen a very slight drop in overall satisfaction, satisfaction still remains at 91%, which is the joint the highest rate of any urban area uh, in the UK. Um, we've also seen significant growth in some areas under that, so value for money is, is one of the ones that I, I would pick out. We've seen a 5% growth in satisfaction with uh, value for money that places us at the, at the highest point there amongst all of our, our peers. So, by no means are we saying that that job's done, but it's encouraging to see that score uh, begin to go in the right direction. On the flip side, we are seeing uh, a decline though in satisfaction with punctuality and reliability, which is really important part of the, uh, the bus offer. So, that really brings into focus what I talked about earlier around the, the green routes bus routes work and making sure that we, uh, we come up with some proposals that will make a difference uh, in that area. So I think both uh, our patronage and satisfaction scores are continued uh, endorsements, if you like, of the, uh, the partnership approach that we're taking locally. Patronage in particular booking the national trend uh, in decline that we see almost everywhere else uh, for, for bus patronage. So, I think we should be really proud of what we're continuing to, uh, to, to achieve in, in, in this area. Uh, the report also highlights some of the milestones for the Alliance that we've achieved in the past quarter. Again, I won't go through every one of them uh, line by line, but I just did, I did want to highlight a couple of the things that are uh, work ongoing, if you like. Firstly, 
um, City Centre Bus Routing Strategy, which is very closely aligned with uh, Liverpool City Centre connectivity uh, schemes. Since we, uh, since we last presented at this committee, this work has now gone from something we've been talking about for, for a long time, particularly the bus, uh, the bus routing elements and kind of spades in the ground to something that's actually now uh, happening. Two of the, um, the things to pick out in that uh, work that have started on Victoria Street. So anyone travelling uh, along Victoria Street, you have felt to notice now what's, uh, what's beginning to take uh, shape there. So we've been working very closely on a operational basis, managing dynamically the bus network to make sure that things are running properly through, uh, through that. And I'm pleased to say that, um, that, that they are working very closely with the City Council uh, with contractors, our control rooms, working with people actually deployed out on Victoria Street, helping customers. So really pleased with this kind of start we've made in the, in the first phase of that. And then the other thing which I'm sure people will, uh, will have certainly heard about is the, the uh, bus hub, which is a really integral part of uh, how buses will need to move around the, the city centre as the chief is uh, planning permission, so that now it allows us to kind of start to move to the next stage uh, in terms of finalising the, the plans for, uh, for for bus routes. And what I'd like to do at the soonest opportunity is uh, come and speak with members again uh, to talk about those proposals uh, in more detail as we kind of start to ramp up the, the communication of those to both stakeholders uh, and, to, and to customers as well. Um, secondly, we're, uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of highlight is in the process of uh, rolling out uh, what's our pioneering traffic uh, signal priority scheme on the 86 bus corridor. It's been some time again in the, uh, in the development and the testing, but we're really pleased that we've now got a system which works uh, really effectively and a model which we can start to roll out now across, uh, across key bus routes. Differs uh, from kind of traditional uh, traffic light triggers for buses in a couple of really important ways, which we don't mind just highlights here. So, uh, firstly, it's about systems talking to each other, not a loop in the ground which detects a, a bus or might detect a lorry if that goes across or might break and, and can never work again. But also, doesn't it means that we can kind of install this without digging up any roads as well, so we avoid any uh, any disruption. So it enables us to roll out on a significant basis in a fairly quick uh, uh, time period with very limited disruption because it's an intelligent system which is getting computer systems to talk to each other. And secondly, because it links to the bus real-time information system, it can be selective about whether the bus is running late or whether the bus is running on time. It can give a green wave for a late running bus, but do a, uh, give a normal cycle for uh, a bus that's on time. And that's important because it helps to regulate the bus flow, but also it's the least disruptive uh, to general traffic uh, as well. So we expect this to have uh, a really significant uh, impact on, uh, on bus flows on that corridor, and we hope to, to roll it out more, more widely going forward. Uh, moving on now to, uh, to the business case, so we, we're continuing uh, the business case work which is looking at the different options available to us for the delivery of bus services enabled through the Bus Services Act and also through uh, devolution. That work's progressing to the plan that we uh, set out. We currently have uh, data requests out with our, uh, our bus operators. The first sets of uh, data have started to, to, to come back this week so that we can start to kind of work on, 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 on that and start to kind of firm up some of the assumptions that we've been made so far. So that works on track and we're still, uh, we're, we're still aiming to complete this phase of, uh, of work in early 2020. I just wanted to on, touch on a couple of other uh, things. So firstly, Again, some members will be aware that we've uh, concluded uh, the biggest contract round that we've had in around eight years, so the biggest, the biggest bus contract round, around four million pounds worth of, uh, of contract awards to, uh, to bus operators, focused predominantly on services uh, in 
Wirral, but also some services uh, in St. Helens. Preparation for this work kind of goes, goes back a number of months, actually crosses over with the, uh, the period where Avon buses went into, uh, went into administration. So we've had an awful lot to consider in that. It wasn't just a case of a, a light for light contract round. We, we built the network up again from, from the ground up, taking into account some of the changes uh, that we've seen and also the need to be as efficient as possible but as delivering as good quality service as, as possible. So it's been an awful lot to uh, to contend with, but we've now made those uh, contracts awards. We've actually seen quite a significant shift in the uh, operator mix, if you, if you like. So uh, we've seen a new operator, Selwyn's, come into uh, the region more solidly, based in, uh, based in, in Halton. Uh, we've seen them with a significant number of contracts through our competitive uh, process. And in order to kind of facilitate that in terms of their rural operation, we're pleased that they've taken over the management of the old APON buses depot. So that's now in the next few weeks going to be an operational uh, depot again. And we're going to be working with them as, as they begin to establish their uh, operations uh, in the region later this month. And finally, we're working really closely with uh, all of our bus operators, large and small, as the uh, ticket machine estate is refreshed right across uh, the region. And that's a real enabler for some of the things that we want to do around ticketing, some of the progress that we want to make uh, in enhancing how people access the bus network and, and making that uh, a lot easier. We're, we're expecting later this year that that will enable us to be able to tell people that every bus in the city region will accept contactless payments, for, for example. Uh, it will also work with the, uh, with the traffic management, um, the traffic signal system as well. It will, it will enable those things to talk to each other. So it will, as well as enabling the ticketing offer to improve, it will hopefully enable the operational aspects of getting people on board quickly and getting buses through traffic lights in, in, in the right way. It will enable those sorts of um, sorts of things as well. So I just wanted to highlight those two additional things that were, uh, were also taking place. So hopefully, as, as usual, you can see from the report that there's a significant level of uh, work happening within the department, a lot of change that we're, uh, that we're managing, hopefully a lot of improvements that, uh, that we, we're trying to bring into the bus offer in the region. As always, I'm happy to uh, take any questions as well. Brilliant, thanks for that. Excellent. I've got Gordon first. Thank you very much, Chair. And I'm sure it's a point that you'd, uh, you'd want to say yourself. I know very often um, when we get changes to the bus network to keep within budgets and the conflicts, I seem like the angry man all the time to you and your team uh, through your chair. Um, but I think what is telling is that it has, as you said, quite correctly uh, booked the trend and that we've increased the patronage. <laughs> I do have a question. I, it's, um, it's, it's, it's one I'm sure I know the answer to, but I'm, I'm probably just amused myself reading it. Uh, it's on, um, where we've got the intervention references on page one, seven, number 410. A 10% decrease in journey times along prioritised routes. I'm sure that's in line with us trying to, because of the problems they have. But I suddenly imagine, Chair, that we're going into a Monty Python sketch where all the timetables are being changed by time by 10%. And so everyone, everyone didn't know what time the bus would be because they had different 10% coming off. I'm sure it's to bring it in line with that but I thought that might just be uh, a bit better check than not going to present earlier than the timetable. Well, first of all, I never think of you as angry and you go to the tour. So, um, the 10% the journey speed increase, that's, that's our target. So we set a target for ourselves to increase journey speeds end to end by 10%. By in some cases, we might be able to do that. In other cases, we might be able to do more. We might do less, but that's that's kind of our, our starting point with it. And that really, what that does, it enables us to be more efficient. So a journey that might take 35 minutes on a five-minute frequency, if that can 
can take 25 minutes, then you actually need less buses in the system to deliver that service. So that can be invested, those two buses can be invested kind of elsewhere. So, and, um, and then the, the kind of timetables and schedules kind of follow, follow that. So that, that is essentially what we're trying to do. Excellent. I've got Harry, then Steve, then John, then Ted. You so Harry, and then Ron. Thanks, sir. Uh, well, thanks for your presentation. Uh, could you give us an update on the uh, talks you have been having with smaller operators uh, as I said, them join the uh, Bus Alliance? Yeah, sure. So we've had positive um, dialogue with two operators. Um, we've, we're, we're doing a little bit of housekeeping work at, at, around kind of making sure that the partnership arrangement that we've got, the actual contract, if you like, um, kind of allows for the correct voting mechanisms and the correct kind of representation on, on the boards. That's some work that we've been doing kind of in the, in the background to get that straight. And then once that's completed, um, the two, op two operators will, uh, will, will sign onto the alliance and we'll have an additional two in there. In there. Yeah, but what about the others? Are we making any progress with other operators? Uh, being completely blunt with you, no. <laughs> we, we, we've tried uh, a number of different uh, ways of getting other operators on board. We've engaged with the Trade Association for the Bus Operators, the Confederation of Passenger Transport. Uh, we meet regularly with a uh, wider group of small operators, both on a, a group basis and on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but despite all of that, we've, we, we've not made uh, any inroads. And a partnership is it's a two-way thing, so we can talk about the, what we think are the benefits to our bus operators of, of working in, in partnership with them. But, if they don't buy that, if they don't accept that, if they have a different view, there's, there's very little we can do. And, and finally, so what are the, what are the main stumbling blocks that you are providing? Uh, I, I think there's a perception among just some operators that the bar is too high, uh, the bar to, uh, to join is too high, and there's costs associated with that. I think. There's a point around that which is which which I would accept that we would expect bus operators to kind of bring something to the table if they're going to join a partnership where they're going to, where they're going to get a significant benefit. And I would say actually a smaller operator gets a much broader benefit than maybe one of the larger operators because they get the, for example, the benefit of a very large marketing campaign for what's a relatively small uh, input for them, but. Um, I think some of those things are, are misconceptions and I also think that we shouldn't be accepting a, a low bar either. I mean, this is a service that's being delivered to people in the city region and we expect operators, whether they're a small operator with 10 vehicles or are even with 600 vehicles, to be investing in, in their products and delivering uh, delivering an improved service. We see smaller operators in other parts of the country doing that, operating in a sustainable way, investing in, in, in their products. But in terms of our smaller operator kind of community, it's a, it's a real mix. We've got some that have that approach and we have some that quite frankly don't have that approach. Okay. Uh, Steve. <coughs> Um, just want to sort of highlight three, four, two, uh, and give a big warm little welcome to Selwyn's <laughs> uh, coming over and locating. Uh, I hope we're going to maximise the fact that there's now a depot for a major operator uh, in the area to try and link in some of those services because uh, being brought up as I, I have in the lo uh, location of Laird Street Depot, um, quite clearly routes can function better when they return it to and from the depot. So I'm, I'm hopeful um, for that because it highlights in that 342, the collapse of Avon and there's still issues in and around replacements of those services. There's still areas uh, of the middle that are isolated, particularly over the evening and the weekend. So I'm looking forward to progress. Just to not let this um, committee know that people are still campaigning, still 
asking for more services of an evening and a Sunday, uh, and I'm hopeful that some progress can be made. But I just want to place on record, welcome that this major operator is now established back on the middle, and hopefully we can maximise that to, to, to the benefit of the people of the world. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I think we'd echo that entirely. We're obviously committed to keeping on working with you for you and your constituents to improve the situation mm -hmm. that, that we've got at the moment. Okay, John. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, for, thanks for that for your presentation. My questions allude to pages uh, 10 and 11, uh, 2.22, about bus patronage. You, yourself, Matt, and other colleagues have mentioned this excellent increase of 9%. I'm just wondering in terms of other city regions across the country, how does that compare? And also, I just want to put on record, I think that's a stupendous rise, given the fact that bus patronage across the country, generally speaking, is declining. So I think that needs to be recorded as well. That's a huge improvement. That's congratulations to everybody involved. But how do we compare with other city regions? That'll be the first question. Do you want to have to take an insert? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So the overall, the overall trend in the UK in city regions is that bus patronage is, is declining. Uh, if you look under that, you, under the skin of that, if you like, it's what, what we're presenting here it's not always exactly comparable because what we're focused on is fair paying patronage. So we're, we're reporting here a 9% increase in fair paying patronage. We don't get that exact figure in the other city regions. What I do know though is that there's been, over recent times, we've seen some increases in Bristol, which have been driven really by the first Bristol getting their fair structure rights, um, not, by, not by anything else. Uh, some increases in small increases in the West Midlands. Again, that appears to be because of a change in pricing uh, structure. But nowhere else is really certainly in terms of urban areas is, re is reporting increases. Every everywhere is kind of generally reporting, uh, and even London actually reporting decreases in, in bus patronage. So, and no one's coming close to the figures that, that we're reporting. That's excellent news. Thank you very much. My second question first to 3.2.5c on page 11, where it says the final report on the Woodchurch Road Corridor has been completed and was presented to the January meeting of the Reliability and Punctuality Workshop. The main conclusion of the report is that there is a case to be made for investment in traffic signaling and bus priorities to improve journey time. I'm just wondering what the financial implications of that are. <coughs> Okay, I don't think that cost uh, of that, and those would need to be, be, be kind of worked up. Um, the reason why that's not kind of moved into delivery phase, is you know, we don't have a, a budget attached to that. But what, what we know is that that would be that would be one of the things that we would wish to take forward if we can identify a budget. Thank you. Sam. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Two questions, Matt. One, one is just a little bit more clarification on the 3.4.1 city centre enforcement post that work of the present type of data on enforcement issues in and out city centre post Christmas infringements being reported to LCC taxi license. Just a bit of clarity on that one. What's, what's been going on? Uh, and the, the other one is the ETM migration to Ticketer 3.4.6. All bus operators, excluding Arriva and Stagecoach, Arriva development Ticketer themselves and Stagecoach who use the big systems, are now signed up to plan to roll up. But the systems that Arriva and Stagecoach put in place are compliant with the measures I will offer that's the smarter ticket. Okay, so just taking those in order, so um, city centre enforcement, that's really around kind of, there's two, there's two angles to that, one's around kind of recording <laughs> issues in the city centre and trying to build a fair living space, and the other is around actually enforcing the things that are, um, that are causing delays to, uh, to, to bus journeys. So what we found, and I, I can, separately I can give you kind of more detail um, for, for the report, I don't have that here, but there are, there are issues that we find which are generally um, kind of confined to 
indiscriminate parking and, and drop off um, for, for private cars. Um, deliveries, again, not being done in agreed hours or in, the, in agreed places. And an over ranking of, ta of taxis as well. So what, what we're saying here is that where we've, where we've got um, ta taxi issues in particular, then we're, we're not the enforcement body for that. So we, we, we take them to, uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the city council. In terms of private motorists, uh, that's kind of working with our PCSOs to kind of solve that issue kind of kind of straight away. So that, that's kind of what we mean by that. But I've got a lot of data, uh, if, if that's something that you're interested in that I could, I'll, I'll happily share with you. Now in terms of the ticket machines, um, yeah, absolutely, Sagecoach and Arriba's uh, machines will be uh, compliant with, with what, what we're trying to do, which is great, because that means that we don't have to we don't have to do it. So the real focus is on getting all the smaller operators in, in the right place with that. There is a little bit of work actually with Stagecoach to do, but they're, uh, they're doing that. And then are either a, a, a buying effectively what we're uh, supporting smaller operators with. So we'll have a, right across the whole uh, fleet, we'll have a, a, a system which does everything that we need it to do in terms of our ticketing plans. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that report. Um, so, uh, just have three questions for you. In terms of pages 9, item 3.13, it says to the bus alliance, five bus corridors have been initially identified for the improvement. Um, so, I use the 68 bus quite regularly, and you know how many times I've been on to you bus doesn't turn up and a lot of uh, bus users are still at the bus stop. However, that bus route has been identified. Are these routes mentioned will stop than the 68 in terms of uh, improved punctuality and reliability? Or are you going to bring it on the next um, of the next phase in terms of targeting improvement? <coughs> what are the after? Uh, yeah, for me, that's our starting point. So we've looked at the, uh, the network, we've looked at the data and, uh, and where the most significant issues are. And these are the first kind of five corridors that, that we've identified. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm really happy to take suggestions from, uh, from, from, from anyone on what other areas that people would like to see us focused on. What I want to do is kind of try and boil the ocean with it as well. I want, to, I want to, us to deliver plans which I know we can deliver and I know we're going to work and will give us a, a model for, uh, for for doing that elsewhere. So I, 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 I know we, we, we talk around, around the issues on, on your route and it's by no means saying that these by solving these five corridors we solve, we solve all the problems. Absolutely not. And I, I would like to do do more of this work on, on, on a wider basis, but we also we need to start somewhere as well. Thank you. Um, my second question, um, item 3.14, it says to pages 11, in terms of the Wimpertry Road to Park Ripple um, survey. So Wimpertry Road is quite a long road. Is it the entire road or are you starting um, from the actual Wimpertry side or more from basically the Waving Tree Picton Road side because that road is quite long and it's referred to as Waving Tree Road so just to get really an idea exactly what you're talking about. It's at the city centre and so it's where, where the works are, are kind of currently happening on the road to is today. So, um, but if you like, I can get someone from the team to kind of show you kind of more detail if that would be, be helpful for you to send that one to you. Yeah, sorry, because yeah, that's my word, so I do know yeah. that word quite well, but it's not um, specified here in terms of where exactly you're referring to. Uh, last but not least, uh, in terms of pages 12, item 3.4.4, it indicates um, this includes regular quality uh, checks on shelters. Do we have um, a schedule in terms of when um, the bus schedule so Is it a program? 
Yeah, we do. So um, our our current plan. This remember, this is just kind of the start of this reestablishment, if you like, of, a, of an inspection program. Our plan doesn't see us go to every every stop, but um, of the ones that we've identified, we will visit those every month, and that will enable us to build up a, a, a picture then over time of whether issues are, are again addressed appropriately within, within the contract. We, we, the way we've set it out it enables us to scale up or, or down, but it's really important that we don't just try and kind of see everything once. We, 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 as, as important as, as that is, we, we also want to kind of see themes as well and, and, and patterns and if there are any kind of, kind of bigger things that we need to address with our contractor. So every, every month it does. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Scott, a question, should take an observation. Uh, I, was going, I just noticed that some of the reports is about reducing journey time and travelling time for people, and also about, uh, I said, the number of buses on the road. Uh, part of that, then, yeah, it shows the same for the operators. So they don't need to run the bus, they make the same time. As we know from our quality contract uh, corridors, uh, there are substantial savings to the operator. But once again, major travel has to put all the infrastructure in to allow us to have the, all the costs towards that. There's no benefit for major travel except so going forward, whether it's through the bus alliance or whether it's through an alternative transport model that comes forward. There should be some shared savings. So if the operators are making a, share, a saving by not having the bus on road, then there should be some payback value through the cheaper fares or some, some form of infrastructure fare part that we put the money into. At the moment, the, the, the beneficiaries of all the work that we do. Uh, but there should be some savings as the public going forward. I mean, that's something we need to be, to be hammering down to the operators. We're making all the interventions, we're making sure their journey times are quicker, and yet they make, the save, they make substantial savings. And that goes on to their profit margin. Nothing comes back to the public purse. Very, very good. Matt, do you want to? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I think that's something we've just started to uh, think about in, um, in our enhanced partnership um, kind of discussions. Um, in principle, I, I don't think the operators have that much objection to it, to be honest, if we're, if we're enabling a, a resource to be, be taken out. I think the, 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 proof is in, the proof is in the pudding, and I think the reality is that we haven't made the progress that I would have liked to have seen to be able to have those conversations in a more robust uh, way. So, but, but certainly, I think, I think there needs to, that benefit to the operator needs to be reinvested some way back into uh, into the network, and that, that principle I think is a really important one. Okay. Just on um, 3.44 page 12, where you say about the bus stops and shelters, um, there's a couple of issues. The quality of information at some of the bus stops for instance, I had um, an elderly lady totally confused because she got on a 10 air uh, bus to going up or going because it stated on the bus shelter that that was part of the route on the 10 air, which it does not go near or going. It can be on straight up the little road. Um, that was one thing. And the other thing about uh, residents asked me about was. Um, the timetables at the bus stops as well. Um, was one thing, and the other thing was not punctuality. It was, you know, sometimes people wait 45 minutes for one bus, which is supposed to run every half hour. Okay, well, I think that hopefully I've described how we're trying to address the punctuality issues. So that, that, that situation described is. It, it isn't acceptable, and why should why should customers put up with that sort of situation? Uh, we need to understand kind of why that sort of thing is happening, but we need to improve 
try to be liability. Of course, is that's what customers are saying. That's what the operational data is saying. It's saying though it's not good enough. Uh, just on, on the 10A issue, I, 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 I'll have to look into that. I'll have to ask one of the team to, 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 to see what the issue is there. I'm not, that hasn't been communicated with me, so I'll, I'll happily look into that specific issue. But Okay, okay. Well, we'll, we'll make sure that, that that's addressed then. Absolutely. I'll, I'll pick that up after this meeting with the, with the team. But, but you, you, I, again, I completely agree with the wider point you make around timetables. I'm getting quite fed up of looking at bus stops and seeing timetables that have fallen down or that have got covered in, in water and you, you, can't, you can't read them or there's a condensation behind the uh, display. It's too much of that. Uh, I can, that can happen sometimes, but it's happening more regularly than I would like to see. So again, that's something that we're determined to, uh, to, to address and, and I'll ask the team to do that. Just another thing, it's not just about you know, not being able to, some of them are outdated, some of the timetables, um, you know, what, what, so, you know, things, timetables have been changed, but the, the times have been changed, but the timetables haven't. And on the, looking at you know the reduction of number of buses on on the road, um, you know we've got the tens and ten A's. Ten A's run by stagecoach and ten A's run by Arriva, and people are asking, you know, why have we got three and four and five buses all coming up Prescott Road, up Liverpool Road, and um, some of them empty, and yet these are the buses that's supposed to be you know viable. You know, when there's other areas where the, they just haven't got a bus service. Well, well again, again, that's that's a problem of the system. So, uh, commercial bus operators are uh, allowed to register and run whatever services uh, they like. It so happens on on that corridor, we have an agreement in place which enables at least some cooperation with. Uh, between uh, between a reader and stagecoach, but on a, you you will get on a high frequency service, particularly where there's competing operators. That sort of situation will will unfortunately happen sometimes. And as noisy travel is actually not all, an awful lot we can do about it, unfortunately. Although well, I probably should look at Mark, that obviously as we're looking at how we use devolved powers, that could be one good way of making sure the kind that we have a wider and more even network looking at the resources that could be available because I think it's, it's a practical point that a lot of people do for things. Ron? Yeah, it's, it's just using good practice from elsewhere. I, I, you know, I've spoken about this more, more than once. You know, I think it's like I've been amazed about this. If, if you've got multiple buses arriving at a bus stop, it's difficult for people like that problem distinguishing where a bus goes. So they get on a bus and, and sometimes the information is just get uh, this play is printed. The actual, the, the easy way is actually having a route uh, plan on, on the bus that sells you. You go from here to here, and there's the stops in between. It would cost a lot. It's just a simple way of, of doing it. The, 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 the good quality, and it happens elsewhere. Sometimes we don't, we try to go along and invent something, when we don't need to. You don't need to reinvent the route, you just need to nick it. And, and, and that's, that's out. All this information is out. All this information. Borrowing, Ron. We're borrowing. Uh, all this information is out there. We don't. We don't. Some time or other, we've got to get, get a hold of this and actually deliver some of this. What we're saying, we're doing, we just tend to talk. I know the problem. 